Northwestern Wildcats had an amazing year in 1995. They actually won big in 1995. Under head coach Gary Barnett, the Northwestern Wildcats completed their season 10 and 2. And they won the Big Ten Conference title, even attended the Rose Bowl uh, game, and were ranked eighth in the nation in 1995. Prior to that, they had been infamous for losing the Big Ten on a regular basis. Uh, they had actually established an NCAA record between 1979 and 1982 for losing 34 consecutive games. They had not had a real winning season in about 24 years prior to 1995. But then 1995 was over and done with, and 1996 was dawning, and the team prepared for the new season. And Coach Barnett, he knew that he needed to fight the habit and get the team to fight the habit from just simply looking back on what they had done in 1995. So he called a team meeting, and it was held in the auditorium of their football center. The coaches were, other coaches were there, and of course the team players took their seats in the plush seating. The coach mounted the stage and said he was handing out awards to the Wildcats, to the various stars of the team and other peoples of the team that they had earned in 1995. The coach called the different players forward. He handed them placards that proclaimed their accomplishments. Seventy plus players cheered and they chanted the names of their fellow teammates. And then they, they also roared as he waved his own uh, placard representing his 17 National Coach of the Year awards. And then the applause ebbed. Coach Barnett walked over to the side of the stage where he had a garbage can and had a big label on the garbage can that had 1995. He gave his placard an, an admiring glance and smile and then dumped it in the trash. And then he walked off. Silence descended upon the team. One by one, the stars of the team they also stood up and they went to the trash can and they placed their placard on top of the coaches and the cash and the try it again and the trash can the trash can soon overflowed the message was plain and simple what they had done in 1995 was amazing and terrific but the calendar now read 1996 leaving the past behind in order to press forward you say well Furthermore, this is 2020. You're about 25 years late. No, I'm not. The church at Ephesus had had achievements. They had accomplishments. They had accolades. They certainly had not been lazy, as we read through the passage earlier in the service. The fervent fire of their first love was associated with the ministries of Paul and that of Timothy and even of the apostle John and it had propelled them forward to proclaim and to promote the gospel of Jesus Christ. They had influence, and they had impact in a cosmopolitan city of their day. And if they had continued to focus on the fervency of their first love for Christ and their first love then for one another, all would have been well indeed. Perhaps part of their problem in the forgetting and the, are the forsaking of their first love for Christ and their first love for one another maybe came from focusing too much on the past achievements and accolades and accomplishments. And the same can be present and the same can be a detrimental effect in our day and age. Jesus commands his church to return to its first love today. The church at Ephesus is not a monolithic church by way of reminder they were a series of house churches meeting in the area, the city of Ephesus and in the region that Ephesus is located in. Hence, that's why Paul's letter to the Ephesians would have been a circular letter that would be like us coming in and reading the, a message, say, from uh, Dr. Futrell during the revival, had we had to do it that way. Here's what Dr. Futrell, Dr. Futrell wants to say, and so I read it here, and then this letter gets passed to the next church and to the next church. That is a circular letter, within reason, obviously being 
uh, a little bit different in the first century A.D. than now. But the church at Ephesus, uh, they were uh, they were an important church, but something had occurred. They were living in a city uh, that was a political city. They were the province of Asia, and therefore their city was one of the capitals of the province of Asia. And then they were a prosperous city. They, being a trade city and a cosmopolitan city, they had money coming in. And they were a polytheistic city. They had numerous gods that were worshipped. They even worshipped several of the emperors. That is known as the cult of the emperor. Nero, uh, Augustus, different, even uh, Julius Caesar, different ones. Domitian, I think, or Hadrian may have been one of the ones that got added to their little pantheon of gods. They had the temple of Artemis, also known as the temple of Diana, which was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And yet something occurred as, as the people had been saved and were making uh, progress. And that first love, which is so incredibly important, something happened. So last time we looked at the context of the city of Ephesus. As we continue this series on the church at Ephesus, we're going to look at actually the commending of the church of Ephesus. And that's important before any time you criticize or critique or judge or assess something or someone, it's always important to find something, if possible, that is noteworthy, praiseworthy. I learned that as a teacher uh, it, when I would grade papers that I always reminded myself, and I tried to remind my students at Benton Academy, that a test paper, a, try, I cannot talk English today, so write these words down. I will hold copyright on them. Let's try this again. Uh, I, when I get to going too fast, I guess I, I uh, mess my words together, and it's no telling what new English words uh, will have. It will be a learning experience. I will give you a test in Blue Book tonight if you come back. All right, but anyway, uh, a, a test is not an indication of your intelligence. It's not an indication of your worth or value as a person or as a student. You can always pull up a test. I'd also remind some of them who were fantabulously smart <laughs> that that test is not always an indication of your continued excellence as well. Because anybody can memorize material and then just reproduce it. It's do you know what you know. But this is not a, uh, a speech on how to teach. But I would always try to find something praiseworthy before I had to criticize because I think that that's important uh, to have balance. And therefore, in this passage, we see the Lord Jesus doing that as well. Now, there are going to be at least one or two churches, one church in particular, there's just nothing good to say. It's, it's basically you need to shape up because you're about to ship out. But that's the church of Laodicea, and we're not looking at that church today commending the church at Ephesus. It is easy to go negative and, and to do so early and to overlook or omit any good or positive effect or issue. And that's such a tragedy. Jesus did not do this. The Word says, The one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands, says this, I know your deeds and toil and perseverance and that you cannot tolerate evil men. And you put to the test those who call themselves apostles, and they are not, and you found them to be false. And you have perseverance, and have endured for my name's sake, and have not grown weary. Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 3 in the New American Standard translation. We see, first of all, Christ identifying himself as he is addressing the church at Ephesus, identifying himself to the pastor and to the pastoral leaders of the house churches. The members of the church at Ephesus are also addressed as well. He was and he is the one, not just a one. He is the one, the one who holds the seven stars. The term employed is the word kraton, and the scholars teach that it means to be strong and to rule. And its root word is krateo, and the, and the scholars teach us that it relates to placing under one's grasp that Jesus Christ had a good grasp of the church at Ephesus. And by way of application, Jesus Christ has a good grasp of the church at Chunky and of all of our sister churches as well. Christ had a grasp on the, the Ephesian condition. 
and those who were conducting the ministry of that particular church. And this introduction returns the hearer back to the inaugural image of Jesus that we have looked at for so long. You probably thought he would never, ever finish the sermon series on the image of Jesus. You know, the hands, the arms, the head, the face, the feet of Jesus, that sermon series. Well, it all comes back. That's why we focus so long on it because now as we address the seven churches, that same image is going to have a connection to each church. Dr. John MacArthur, who is the pastor of, I believe, Grace Church out in California, he's also a well-known Bible teacher and scholar of himself, says, and I quote, the seven stars are the messengers who represent the seven churches, the leaders, not the spiritual beings, the angels themselves, that God had them in hand, that Jesus had them in hand. And they were and are His to command. And that is a, a good place to be. We are never out of the grasp of Jesus Christ. There is nowhere you can go. There is no, no depth which you can sink that you are not beyond the grip and the grasp of the grace and love of Jesus Christ this morning. It's entirely possible that the pastors slash pastors, because I'm thinking of the various house churches and other church leaders, had turned away from the fervent first love and the congregations followed them. That's a, a scary responsibility. That's why it's important for every church, from the pastor to the deacons to the Sunday school teachers to the, the workers to everybody who makes up a congregation who is born again and blood-bought by Jesus Christ to be in prayer. I remember when I came to another church one time, the interim pastor of that particular church looked at me because I was about to come on board as the pastor, and he says, Pastor, and he pointed his finger right at me, had a big smile, but it wasn't just a, hey, hey, and it wasn't that. It was one of those, I felt like I was in the headmaster's office, to be honest with you. He says, Pastor, be a man of prayer. I will always have those words echo. We need to be a people of prayer. And I'm not suggesting that you're not, but I am calling us to that, reminding, and that's one reason why I'm excited that we can come back on site and have prayer meeting because we need to be a people of the book and a people of prayer so that our fervent first love does not cool, that we do not forget it nor do we forsake it. These congregations, especially the Ephesian church, had followed perhaps in the wrong direction. As this message unfolds for Ephesus, the pastor leaders are called to apply first aid to their first love. And the church and the house churches that make up the church at Ephesus is called to apply first aid for the first love. Dr. William Barclay says, the image of Christ having the seven stars in his hands means that there is a complete control over the church. If the church submits to the control of Christ, it will never go wrong. Doctrine and existence are safe. Our safety and our security lies there. The whole of the church, that is the individual and the collective, is in the hand of Jesus Christ. What a comforting thought. In this day and age of 2020, we are in the grasp and we are in the hand of Jesus Christ. We are not at the mercy of COVID-19 or government or industry or anything else. The way that you view God will eventually show up in the way that you live your life. Something happened at Ephesus. We'll be looking at that the next time that we come back to this sermon. But let's look at the positive aspect of Ephesus today. The pastor and leaders of Ephesus were in the Lord's hand and were his to command for the sake of themselves and for the greater good and for the spiritual health and welfare of the collective congregations that make up the church at Ephesus. Jesus identified himself as the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands. Lampstands are the churches themselves. Ephesus was one such lampstand. A lampstand shines, it has light, it dispels the dark. I like the song, Getting Used to the Dark, although I would challenge us, let us never accept the dark as the status quo. Let us never feel at home in the dark. Let us 
reflect and shine the light. The best way to dispel the darkness is to shine the light and to shine it fervently with a love for Jesus Christ, a love for one another, so that we are then taken seriously and with credibility when we say that we will love others who are outside the doors of this building but not outside the doors of our heart. God's love can shine and should shine greatly in us and through us. The term employed is the word peripatetic peripatum and the scholars teach us that it means to walk to walk comprehensively as in you're walking in a circle I'm not going to because knowing my I don't like the word luck but knowing my luck if I were to walk around and come back up somewhere I'm going to trip and being on cyberspace that would be probably hey we probably get a lot of subscribers that'd be awesome uh, you know that'd be cool but that's not the way you probably want you know to stand out that poor pastor just felt face planted it right there uh, it, hey if it brings somebody to Christ then I will do it but let's if, if I don't have to I would prefer not to fall or face plant but to walk in a circle meaning to come full circle in 2005 I was able to get a Chevy Silverado pickup truck. It was love at first sight, even though we went to just look. I looked it up from top to bottom, all around. I even test drove it. I was not intending to come home without it, and by the grace of God, I have it today. I did not merely view an image online and click it, although I'm sure you can do that today. I gave it my full attention. I gave it my full assessment and it was a personal investment, so to speak. The idea of coming full circle, not just something, oh, it would be nice to have a pickup truck and, and just kind of you know, think of it and every now and then click on it and maybe a, a generally talk about it, but actually being specific, coming full circle from beginning to end. Dr. Albert Barnes, who is also a Bible teacher, says, Christ was walking amid his churches, suggesting an image of constant vigilant supervision, inspecting and assessing, perhaps also with the idea that he went among them and I never really, I should have, but I never really had thought about this before. Not coming in as, oh, I'm checking you out. I'm making sure, do you have your mask on? I'm, I'm checking you out this morning. No, he's not coming in as, a, as a, a police type situation, but rather coming in and walking among his churches, going the circuit, if you will, going full circle and such, as a friend who has a great love and care and concern for each of his churches. Those churches represent some Bible scholars. So, well, they represent the various church ages. Perhaps so. I believe that they were actually seven churches with, with issues that Jesus was critically concerned with. And they also can represent the types of churches today, but also the types of believers. Believers who are going through the motion, but their fervent first love has kind of waned uh, to the side, and it's time to fan that back into flame. Are those who, like Philadelphia, they're going full throttle, and the only thing Jesus says, keep on keeping on. There's an open door, let nothing stay your hand, but that's coming at a later time. Uh, but the idea that Jesus is, is doing this because he desires to bless his church. Why? So that his church may be fruitful for him. So that we are able to shine brightly in people who come under the conviction of the Holy Spirit and then have the courage as the Lord would call them to his word, his worship, and his work to make that commitment, not just uh, on their own, but also uh, corporately coming together. Barclay expands on this and says that Christ's unwearied activity in the midst of his churches, he's not confined. He is in all of them simultaneously because he is God. There is no church from which his presence is absent. Even the churches that might have Ichabod written across the door, which is an Old Testament word that says the glory has departed. And even there he stands at the door and knocks. And if any should open and come to him, he will come into them and will fellowship with them, bringing that revival and restoration. The church at Laodicea would probably be one that would have Ichabod written across that door. In the digital age, it is possible for a pastor to be on multiple church site campuses at the same time, whether through streaming, internet, satellite, and the worship services uh, or to actually have worship and work meetings. It's uh, phenomenal. But back in the day, before what we take for granted today, I had a class at the seminary from 1999 and 2000, the year I graduated, 
a theology class, and the professor had actually flown to an extension center. I want to say it was in Florida. It could have been North Georgia. I, I don't remember which location, but he had flown to teach class there. But my class, which was a night class, was meeting that night. You say, well, how can he teach you and be in Florida or be in Georgia? Easily. It was compressed interaction video. Literally cutting-edge technology then. Probably not so much today, but you know, because we live in such a digital age right now, but this was at the beginning of all that, at least the beginning as I understood it. It probably had been around for some time, but sometimes I'm a little late to the party, but when I get there, we're good. So anyway, we came in, and he's addressing us. On, he's a talking head on the TV, and we're in the classroom. And, of course, you could actually uh, interact. It wasn't just a case he's broadcasting and you have no way. You, it was like a two-way uh, uh, conversation. I mean, literally, I, I could ask him a question and he would call my name and respond. It just maybe a little, little slight delay, but not very much live. It's amazing what could be done. It's also amazing some of the practical jokes that certain people led the uh, class to do. There was one time when... Um, we pranked him by having the other class, when he was teaching in New Orleans, they made sure that they were just outside of camera range. He comes in ready to teach, ain't nobody there. He got a little plussed, uh, unplugged about that. And then finally they came in, of course, he knew he had just been pranked. He was not very happy about that, but I wouldn't know who put anybody up to that. But anyway, um, but the idea that Christ being in the presence of his church. He's not confined to one church at a time. He's with our sister churches today, and he knows it like it is, both the good and the bad. How do we apply this this morning as Christ identifies himself? Christ has his church, his leaders, you and me in hand. Are you and I sure we are his to command? Do we continue to pray to have that fervent first love to know the hand of God upon us individually and collectively. A hand that is not oppressive, but a hand that says, I've got this because I've got you. Do not be afraid. Are we, especially leaders, myself included, are we willing to have our spiritual temperature taken by the great physician and to make adjustments as he sees fit? To make adjustments so that he may use us to set the spiritual thermostat for the health of the congregation or congregations at large. God could use this church in a season of revival as a catalyst for revival to do amazing things. Why not as Charles Spurgeon, and I believe, oh, I can't think of the guy's name, but he was the father of missions, went to India. I knew I was going to pull a, a, a blank for a minute. Who said... Expect great things from God. Attempt great things from God. I remember that. At 2 a.m., I'll send out a, a devotional text to everybody. I got the name. So be expect. No, I won't do that to you. I'll just do it at, at 12. Anyway, moving on. Um, are we willing to trust God to do great things in us and through us, not just for us, but to use us? Are we willing to have that thermostat taken, or uh, that temperature taken for the thermostat? William Carey, that was the guy. I knew I'd remember it. As members, myself included, are we willing to have that spiritual thermostat adjusted? Sometimes we just get comfortable at a certain temperature. I like to be comfortable at night when I sleep, and I like it to be cold. <laughs> it's just me, you know. Uh, I love wintertime uh, and everything. Um, you know, some people want it to be, you know, actually warmer. I, I don't know. You know, we get comfortable at a certain spiritual temperature, do we not? And that's the danger is if we get comfortable at a certain spiritual temperature that could it be that our first love, that is fiery or fervent, could it begin to just chill? Not, not an ice storm coming, no. But just beginning to cool just a little bit, one degree at a time. Christ is present in this church. COVID-19 and any subsidiary issues has not distanced him from us or us from him. He desires that we shine our lamps outward. Does God's great love shine in us greatly today? Does God's great love shine from us greatly today? Dr. Ronnie Floyd is the president of the Southern Baptist Convention Executive Committee, and he's also a former pastor, had been, I want to say, it, uh, North, I, there was a name, and I can't remember that as well. Um, apparently I did not eat my Wheaties this morning, but that's okay. 
but basically the church he had been in Springdale, Arkansas. I know where. I just I think they changed the name a while back. Phenomenal. I had the privilege of meeting him one time. He recently shared online how he has been burdened of late since late February about the strife and division that's in our nation, that's in our denomination even, among other Christians and evangelicals, even uh, sometimes the mean-spirited statements uh, that are sometimes online, breeding disharmony, and added to this just the unprecedented and tragic time that we're going through as a world, much less, less a nation. So he entered into a time of 40-day fasting and prayer. He is phenomenal in that. And he was sustained by the Lord, by the Holy Spirit, by the Word of God. He says, and I quote, Our gracious God gave me some special words on day 37 and 38 of the fast. They, these words were declared by our God four times in the book of Haggai. This statement is given only in Haggai verse one. I'm sorry, Haggai chapter one verse five, Haggai chapter one verse seven. When the Lord of Armies says, "Think carefully about your ways," or you might phrase it this way: "Carefully consider your ways." And as God spoke these words to prepare His people for a great and new work among them in their days. Dr. Floyd says, I believe he is also preparing us for a great and new work for the days ahead. But it begins with us carefully and prayerfully considering our ways. Oh Lord, help me privately and personally. Help us collectively to have a fervent first love. In the view of the church of Ephesus, Christ would have them consider and act upon their ways regarding him. And this is essential for our churches in this day and age as well. But also we see not only Christ's identification, we see Christ's information. Here begins his commending of the church. There is an acknowledgement. I know your deeds and your toil and perseverance. Christ began with an affirming acknowledgement rather than a stinging rebuke. Now, I've been on the receiving end of a chewing out before. I've been on the receiving end of a stinging rebuke. Made worse when it wasn't my fault, but it was my responsibility. I learned a long time ago, when placed in command, you take charge. And that means you take responsibility for those under your command. Although I've never served in the military, I have served in positions of authority. And there have been times where somebody else didn't do their job. They're not looking at the underling, they're looking at you. And so you have to own it like a boss. And there's, I've been on the receiving end, and that's never a fun thing. But Jesus began with this acknowledgement. And the term utilized here in the, in the language of the New Testament means to have perceived, even to understand and to recognize, say the scholar. They had been busy in the work of the life of faith. Work here is the word erga. And the scholars state that it shows a work or a worker who has or is accomplishing a purpose. They had been doing the work of the Lord and evidence had proved that they had done that. Dr. Ken easily states Jesus knows the facts. Christians of Ephesus were always busy. They received a triple commendation. Deeds are expressed actively through hard work or passively through putting up with hardship. They had known toil. In that language, it is, is laborious toil, debilitating even, fatigue. In other words, they had worked themselves to the bone, and yet they had pushed hard and pushed forward with that fervency. Labor to the point of sweat and exhaustion. Going all out, says Barclay. Barnes would add, it is, it is toil that produces sorrow. Faithful service to Christ likely produced trouble for them to have to work through because not everybody in their community, community there's another word, community, write it down. Not everybody in their community, community not everybody in their town was happy uh, with them. Okay, we'll just go something simple to pronounce today. Not everybody in their town or city was happy, happy, joy, joy about what the church was doing. They had persevered. That is emphasized twice. They had kept on, keeping on. The term is hupomonen. And the scholars continue to teach us it is a remaining behind, a patient endurance, a steadfastness under pressure that is God-inspired. They made mention that it is a hope filled with endurance. I would say that's a pretty good commendation. That's a good commendation for the church at Chunky. It's a good commendation for you or for me in our private and personal life. I close with this illustration as we consider our application. 
the 3200 meter run is an endurance test. It is the race as far as I'm concerned. Eight laps, eight miserable laps. If ever you want something to, to compare eternity to, just try running those eight laps for time. That's not fun. It tests your form. It tests your technique. It tests your strategy. It tests your stamina. It tests your speed. And then it also tests how well you compete against others who are equally tested as you are running against them. And a good runner stays focused and paced in tone and tempo, and tempo thinking about thinking one or two laps ahead always what their time needs to be for each section of that race pushing through the fatigue, pushing through the pain, envisioning what they must do to finish well, then resolving and acting on doing that, making it happen that, so that they do not walk off the track after being lapped. I watched a young runner from, in an MAIS school struggle to complete his eight laps. The race was over. He was the last one running. There were cat calls from the, from the stands. Just give it, I mean, just hard. I, I was like shocked. I'm like, seriously? So every time he would run by, I would try to shout out, you got this. The race is over. But he was sent to run a race. He had no probably chance of winning, but his coach wanted him to run. And I said, you got this. Hang in there. I don't know if he heard me or not. I, I suspect oxygen deprivation at that point. He didn't hear much. And then I saw something amazing happen. As he got to that last lap, he had to walk a little bit. He was kind of hurting. Even I was starting to say, just walk off. It, it's just not worth your health. But then his teammates gathered on the other side of the field, and they began to cheer him on. And they began to, they began to jog with him until he got into the last of that curve. And then there's that straightaway to the end. And the race was over as far as who won the ribbon that day. And then he began to sprint. And I stood and applauded. What an amazing moment as we think about the same opportunity that Christ gives us to continue our race, to be able to reclaim a fervent first love. He acknowledges all that you have done for him and through him with a fiery devotion of first love. No sacrifice is made. No sacrifice that is made is ever forgotten, but it's recorded and it's rewarded. Do you and I trust him? to be aware of what we have done and are doing today. Are we doing things from that first love point of view? We're not just wanting to have a track record, but we're wanting to serve Him with a fervency. First love propels and promotes work, labor of love for the Lord. We put our, our head, our heart, and hand to a task and see, see it through to completion and hopefully fruition to be and to do both in active and passive modes as the need may require. That is passion and pursuit of first love for Christ. Does this describe us? Does this describe you today? Does this describe our sister churches today? It can. Does your first love keep pushing you in the race, patiently pushing you forward? Or are you in need of that first aid for the first love? We'll resume our look at a Ephesians later, but today is important because this is the opportunity for to respond. Those watching at home, although uh, when we have the invitation, we do turn the camera off so that way if, uh, those who would want to do business with the Lord are able to do so if they want to step out forward and not be broadcast across cyberspace. But for those who are watching before we do uh, turn the camera off, this is your moment to respond to Jesus Christ. And if you have never trusted Christ as Lord and Savior, let today be the day that you begin that fervent, fiery first love. Also, for us gathered here, the Lord may be calling you to come to this altar to do business with Him in whatever shape, form, or fashion may be. Is the Lord calling you to return to a, a fervent first love? The, the accolades and the achievements that you have, have made and done in times past, those are fantabulously awesome. But this is a new day, and, and it's easy to look back and get into that rut of routine. Is the Lord calling you to, to something deeper or even higher today? Or there may be some other decision. That may be among us today anyone that does not know Christ or is not sure of knowing Jesus Christ. Let today be the day that you nail it down. Eternity is too long, and life is too short to have a I don't know so, but to have a I know so 
salvation. Let us stand as we sing this morning our hymn of invitation, and you come as the Lord leads you to come this morning.